Hello and welcome to the fifth in our series of decolonization and democratization seminars. Um, my name is Liz Tregenza and I am one of the curators for Colchester and Ipswich Museum Service. Um, and I am delighted to be sharing this, uh, to be chairing, sorry, this session on sharing power. Um, so tonight, rather than our standard two papers, we actually have three papers. Um, so these are coming through, um, coming from even um, Paul Crook and um, Emmanuel Andrews from the South London Gallery, Philip Newton from York Museum and Galleries, and um, Melanie Hollis and Ivy Scott from Ipswich Museums. Just to say, if anyone has any questions, uh, please do pop those into the YouTube chat um, or share them with us on Twitter. Um, now, I'm sorry if anything does go wrong tonight. We're a bit new with this still. Um, okay, so I am delighted to introduce our first speakers. Uh, that is Paul Crook and Emmanuel Andrews from the South London Ga Gallery. He'll be talking on the subject of entanglements who makes history, over to you. Hello, um, we we're gonna have a pre short presentation, but we thought we'd start just by showing our faces. Um, my name's Paul Crook, um, my pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm the Young People's Program Manager at the South London Gallery. Hi everyone, my oh. name is Emmanuel Andrews, my pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the researchers in residence at the South London Gallery working on the Reentanglements project. Okay, um, so um, we're going to be talking about um, a project that we're currently, well, still in the process of working on now, which is called Entanglements Who Makes History? Um, and this project um, is seen um, as working with the colonial era archive in the context of our young people's uh, program. And we're hoping today to kind of bring a dual perspective to the project. Um, Emmanuel and I have been working very closely from the perspective of me as a program manager um, and Emmanuel as a researcher. Um, we're gonna be running through, giving kind of an overview of the project um, and then sharing some key learning hopefully from a kind of frank and honest perspective. And we'll finish by trying to think about how we, um, what's the kind of future, um, how can we embed this into future programs? Um, and as I said, this is a project we've been working on since, since September, 2019, and we're just uh, very close to finishing in the new year. I thought I'd start just by giving a little bit of context from where, where, we, where we are. Um, so the South London Gallery um, was founded in 1891 and it's a public funded, Gallery of Contemporary Art, and um, it has a changing display of exhibitions across two sites. Um, it's located in Peckham in Southeast London, and Peckham is an incredibly, uh, our local area, Peckham Campbell, is an incredibly diverse neighbourhood. Um, it's actually home to the highest density of Nigerian communities um, in Britain, and that's significant to this project, as we'll hear. Um, and within the gallery, there's an uh, education programme working with different audience strands, um, schools, um, families. Um, and this particular programme, we've been working with our youth forum, uh, who go by the name of the Art Assassins. Um, they, the youth forum has been around for about 10 years. And it's a group of young people um, aged 14 to 21 um, from very different backgrounds, but all uh, located in South London. Um, in the, the neighbourhood surrounding where the gallery is. And we recruit the group um, through schools and uh, colleges, but also a lot of word of mouth. So because the programme's been on for a long time now, we find that people recommend people. Um, and we've had a few young people who've been with us for, a few who started the project this time, but also ones who've been with us for a number of years. Um, and what they do, so it's a peer-led group, and really it's kind of, we work with young people to um, put together projects, events, they work with artists, curators, and it's really the kind of peer-led model. So it's about giving young people a platform and space to program and hopefully in turn, um, open up the gallery for other young people as well. So we have been working with a really rich and extensive archive on this project. Um, the archive was collected by an anthropologist called Northcote Thomas, um, who was working in Nigeria and Sierra Leone between the years 1909 and 1915. 
Um, and one of the things that drew me to this project and still fascinates me is the very fact that Northcote Thomas uh, was enlisted by the British government, um, by the colonial government actually, um, to work in Nigeria and Sierra Leone for the purpose of strengthening colonial governance of those um, of the communities there. So already from the from the get go, it's um, this archive is steeped in colonial era history and his very presence was there because of the colonial project. Um, whilst he was there, he collected um, a really unique um, ethnographic uh, collection. So uh, artifacts, as you can see uh, in the in the screen right now, photographs, sound recordings and botanical specimens. Um, so a really diverse range of, uh, of collections that make up the archive itself. Um, currently the archive is held in mostly in London and Cambridge and um, up until recently it's been completely inaccessible. Um, the inaccessibility of it is adds a kind of another layer to why it's a really, you know, why we're so lucky to be working with this project now, um, because it's largely been a history that's been kind of forgotten about, partly because of um, the kind of status of Northcote Thomas himself as an anthropologist, partly because of curatorial and conservation practices, um, but also as well, interestingly, you know, as, as a result of these things being housed in the UK, they've been um, separated from their countries of origin and from the communities there. But as Paul will no doubt talk about um, when he mentions the other parts of the project, um, one element of the project has been working with local communities um, to yeah, discuss and research further the significance of the collection. Um, what is a kind of more, um, another challenge to this project is the fact that many of the, much of the cultural heritage that Northcote Thomas documented. So the languages, the dialects, the cultural practices and the material culture has either disappeared or it's endangered. So we kind of lean on this archive to provide us with that like historical memory um, as well as much as it's really embedded with that violence as well as being part of the colonial project. Um, that said, a lot of the um, a lot of the objects that he um, that he curated into his archive um, were actually bought or commissioned. Um, obviously there's that lens of can they ever have been ethically bought or ethically commissioned um, but I think that adds another kind of layer and another challenge um, because there is that argument of you know they weren't necessarily stolen or not all of it was stolen some of it was commissioned or bought. Um, I think another interesting factor to this is the fact that Northcote Thomas introduced really new technologies not just to Nigeria and Sierra Leone but to the world in general. He was using um, wax cylinder recordings um, and photography, he was using cameras, which um, yeah, were very, uh, it was really significant to be using at this time. Um, and then I guess my kind of last point is the interesting fact of, and this is something I'll talk more about, but he himself as an anthropologist was uh, it's documented that he was quite a nuisance to the colonial project. He, he was a very kind of enigmatic anthropologist. He wanted to kind of break rules. He wanted to really take his, um, the methodology of anthropology, so ethnography, really seriously, um, much to the kind of disdain of um, many of the, yeah, the, the, the colonial governments of the time that wanted to use his anthropology, anthropological findings for a specific purpose. You know, he was doing it from the perspective of an anthropologist. He wanted to understand a culture more, understand a community more, but he actually didn't serve the purpose necessarily of being able to help govern these communities. Um, so just a bit of a background on the project. Um, it's essentially what we're kind of asking on the overarching questions is what does this collection mean for a group of young people living in South London today? Um, and it came about um, for a collaboration with um, Paul Babasu at SOAS, um, who is part of a bigger research project called Museum, Afford Museum Affordances Reentanglements that's been looking at this collection. Um, and we were very fortunate to um, be funded by um, the Heritage Lottery Fund um, to work on this project. And it uh, also involves a big uh, network of partners, um, including SOAS, uh, UCL Institute of Art Archaeology, Autograph in London, and the Ebo Studies Initiative also. Um, just to kind of cover what's at stake really in kind of working on this project, um, as um, Emmanuel alluded to, um, 
This is a really interesting archive um, and um, often the, the art assassins have worked with archives before and, and been interested in digging deeper and finding the kind of um, the tensions or the interesting things in the history but really this archive is very much at the face of it, it requires us to deal with very uncomfortable and difficult histories. Um, so for us in the first instance it was really a chance to uh, for young people across these age groups to kind of um, learn about Britain's colonial history. Um, also, but there's also a kind of shared interest with the bigger project, which is that um, a lot of um, this, this, this um, material culture and um, intangible cultural heritage um, um, is a, paints a really rich uh, portrait of West Africa at the time and isn't widely known about amongst those communities. So there was a shared goal with the other project in trying to connect this, um, this, these assets to um, um, communities work, living, young people from the communities in Peckham and um, Camberwell, which is kind of a shared goal is because we're trying to work with those uh, young people in those communities for our assassins as well. And the other side of it was to also equip the young people with uh, transferable skills around heritage that'd be useful uh, to employment. One thing that we were really conscious of was the issue of not simply wanting to educate them about colonial history. Obviously, we don't learn about this in schools. And we did want to, you know, part of the kind of um, one of the outcomes was that they would be more educated, but really and truly we wanted to empower them so that they themselves could actively participate in debates around colonialism, colonialism and decolonization, um, and also for their contributions to those debates and those discussions to not be so black and white. I think we often take for granted already how, um, how tapped into these conversations young people are, but also how they can grapple with these, you know, really complex ethical conversations and, and issues that aren't simply black and white. Um, so we really wanted to embark on a sophisticated investigation on how we can understand this collection, especially in the year 2020, um, as I'm sure many of the many of the people on this panel today will, will you know, touch upon. This was a really significant year. We saw um, we saw statues coming down. So these questions and these discussions, um, you know, were taking place within very live contributions around uh, colonial history. Um, but how also could we complicate that history and complicate the, the colonial frame itself? Um, we really wanted to challenge and complicate our understandings of power. Um, so when it came to Northcote Thomas as an anthropologist and as, you know, himself as a researcher in his own right, we wanted to complicate what it meant for him to be this person that supposedly holds all the power and the people he was investigating to be these victims um, uh, and that was also important because we were um, even though we specifically weren't working with the local communities the local communities obviously still exist there are still families and people who uh, live in the communities in Nigeria and Sierra Leone that he was working with so it was really important that we didn't simply just say that you know these languages are lost completely and they don't have any significance today. Um, and as I'll talk more about, um, we I certainly try to take them on a journey of creative and disruptive methodologies and bring uh, in black the black radical tradition to black feminist theory um, to the discussion as well. Um, so just an overview of what the program looked like in terms of this this year's um, per, oh, year we've had working with the uh, collection. Um, We've, it's been really structured mainly around um, art, two artist projects, which I can touch on in more detail in a sec. Um, one with um, Onyeka Igwe and Rosa Johan Udo, um, who are working with the group to interrogate parts of the collection. And that was very close to um, their own practices and what they're interested in in terms of uh, decolonial thinking. Um, we also uh, did some heritage skills training. So the group were learning how to work with photographic archives, um, how, the con uh, co how the collections conserved, and also learning how to uh, record oral histories with um, people, people in the diaspora um, living in our local area. And this was really trying to, as Emmanuel's kind of alluding to, we were trying to build up a kind of uh, complicated picture and different lenses on the archive through all these different, um, different methodologies. Um, be it from an artist's perspective or through the eyes of a conservationist, um, through someone who's working in oral history or translation. Um, and then also within that, we were also having these moments of kind of uh, peer-led programs. So um, the, the group have been documenting themselves to produce a film and there's gonna be an ex exhibition. We've had events and publications as well. 
the other side of this project that I haven't got time to talk about, but there is also um, translation work happening on the uh, historical sound recordings and conservation work happening on the uh, material cultures that's um, led by experts, but they are the ones delivering, delivering the training. And of course, the other big aspect of the project is we've had um, a researcher in residence, two research in, research in residence, residence actually, um, Emma Dabry and Emmanuel, um, who's here. <laughs> and you may be going to say a little bit about your process. Yeah, so um, I guess the main kind of thrust for me that I've, I've touched on already was was really trying to challenge that simple like um, colonizer victim narrative. Um, obviously, while still paying tribute to the fact that these are really violent histories, but how can, as I said, how can we complicate that? How can we um, not simply uh, take strip away agency from um, the communities that were being studied by Northcote Thomas? Um, and one of the ways I did that was really just thinking myself like what was the history that I wish I had been taught about? And obviously my black history um, education in the UK and the British education system was very lacking. But what I really enjoyed learning about later in life was understanding histories of resistance. Um, so how can we give, how can we not give voice to, um, to these communities, you know, put in a voice that we, that, that we assume them to have, but um, how can we just, yeah, we, I mean, it's, it's hard to talk about, but I can, and we don't have much time, but um, I can just give quick examples of some of the exercises that I did with the youth. So that was, um, I did a speculative, speculative fiction exercise. Um, we flipped the lens on Northcote Thomas himself to try to um, view him, uh, do an anthropology of him as in, a sen in essence, um, to using uh, decolonial and theoretical um, basis um, to understand the artistic practices that the artists were doing as well. Um, and just to note about these um, two artist commissions that uh, have been our big major outcome. So on the left is a picture from uh, Onyeka's project, which is the group were trying to interrogate the historical sound recordings, which involved them um, recording their own archive, thinking about um, how are young people documented and how might they be understood in 100 years time. And then these two things came together with samples, um, which is what you're seeing there in a workshop, which we're putting together this sounds collaborative soundscape. Um, and then also on the right is a, a still from um, Rosa Johan's project where, which happened in, in the pandemic over Zoom where the group were trying to interrogate the um, uh, material culture that's in the collection and kind of remaking um, objects and kind of recasting them into, into new uh, speculative um, uh, stories. And this is all coming together right now into an exhibition which is titled An Archive by Other Means. Um, which we're trying to instigate a kind of process of collective curation and um, create a show that kind of shows many of the different kind of like viewpoints on the archive and also is a platform for showing the work that they've created. Um, maybe I'll keep going because we're out of time. So yeah, just wanted to get to the key learning, of course. Um, so yeah, in terms of the, the big outcome, well, the big bits of learning that I wanted to share in this presentation was first is I think, um, being in that being it coming in and working in a contemporary art gallery and in this very specific context, which is a kind of young people's forum, I really think that the kind of alternative learning space that's set up or afforded by that um, has been really crucial. And um, this happens after school, it's um, across age groups, it's not a history lesson, it's not an art lesson. And I think that, and we in our kind of um, end of project or well, mid project questionnaires, people have kind of talked about that. about. Being in, this, being in this kind of in-between space and also that it's very embodied learning. So we'll talk, but we'll also kind of make and collage and cut. So I think that's been kind of um, highlighted that this is a kind of great space for um, working with a collection like this. Um, the cross-disciplinary aspect I think has been really important. So I think we've balanced the kind of um, specific disciplines like conservation with more speculative approaches, say from the artists. And I think that's give a, given a quite holistic view um, for the for the young people and it's allowed them to see kind of materials from the collection in different light um, and that's another and a, a moment when that's really really worked I think is when it's also kind of really blurred together disciplines so for example in the oral history recording then rather than becoming oral histories they actually turned into like conversations with people about the archive and then those recordings became samples that ended up in the soundscape so a real kind of flattening of disciplines which I think is really in keeping with the kind of thinking beyond kind of western colonial frames um, but that is not without tension I think one thing in the project um, sometimes these disciplines and the people working them as caught as there's been tensions with that and also along generational lines I think has been um, really important learning. Um, I think okay I've got three minutes on my timer. Um, 
uh, influencers. Just wanted to drop a note about influencers because you know um, the other there's a moment on this project where we're trying to reach other young people um, who might be in, interested in and uh, our other research and residents. Um, Emma Dabry posted about the project on her on her Instagram, and it was just a kind of real um, uh, light bulb moment. Of course, like the, having that person who's a researcher, but also this person of influence, has helped us reach these. And we ended up recruiting three new young people, all with like family links to Sierra Leone, interested in this project. So that was just a really kind of important learning uh, moment for me. I think questioning assumptions. Uh, Emmanuel's kind of touched on it, but I often talked about this project at the start about you know teaching young people about um, what they don't know about colonialism is kind of very de de deficit model and actually the group is super diverse some of the young people are really already tuned into this history or taken uh, play, doing activism so just kind of really questioning and trying to start from a more of an asset-based uh, approach um, and just a note about the outcome driven aspect of it is it was challenging sometimes like with the show you know we're trying to resolve a lot into this display and that gets super difficult and that's something we're really grappling with at the moment um i think we're just about there it's your turn <laughs> i think we're actually like bang on time so to close we just wanted to um consider this question that we've been discussing internally um which is how to embed explorations of decolonization and democratization in future programs and projects with young people um and for us it was or at least for me i think acknowledging um artists and researchers having that kind of mix of of different people on the project but also importantly was having a diverse set of people in the room so i'm a black woman um the other artists were also black women and having people who either you know come from the the, the places that we're talking about um but also can you know relate to people um, to relate to the young people in a different way. They often haven't had black teachers um, and they certainly haven't necessarily seen um, people of color in senior positions. So that like actually bringing this decolonial lens to the program itself has been really important um, to me, certainly. And I think we're just on time. Uh, and just um, in terms of, so I wanted to throw this question out there, but just to also say like, it's again, it's a question we're really working with at the moment. And one of our next steps is to think about how we embed this into future programs, as it says. So we're trying to take some of the learning and maybe one, one step we're taking now is we've started a new program called Making Sense. And we're thinking about taking this youth forum model into schools and um, how that might, um, be an important space for kind of building kind of um, racial literacy and also kind of diversity in the curriculum with teachers and young people. So that's where we're kind of at with it, but all, and also the cross-disciplinary aspect of it with other cultural organizations. But yeah, this, we kind of end where we're at at the moment, with the project. Thank you. Thank you. And this is about the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul and Emmanuel. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and if anyone has any questions they want to ask, please do pop this either on Twitter or in uh, the YouTube, on YouTube, and uh, we'll pop, pop the questions to Paul and Emmanuel at the end of this session. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Philip Newton. Uh, Philip is from York Museums, and we'll be talking about... This is the problem when my... Uh, my screen isn't showing the right part. Rethinking engagement from exploitation to empowerment, understanding how museums can devolve power to create wider engagement. Okay, and over to you, Philip. Good evening, everyone. So first caveat is I put this proposal in before COVID. So even though it is about devolving power, a lot of that got put on hold, um, but I will discuss kind of the general overview of what we were planning and hopefully what will happen going forward. So uh, first of all, hello, I'm Philip Newton. My pronouns are he and him, and I work for York Museums Trust in the center of the city of York. And I've worked there now for over six years. I joined as an assistant curator and then moved into volunteer management and now in community engagement. And my role is split between volunteers and communities, but with um, furlough and the lockdown process and all that sort of stuff, I've been made full-time engagement. So uh, a little bit about the history of YMT. Uh, so in 2002, York Museum Trust was formed from what was a council run service to an independent charitable trust. And YMT manages on behalf of the city of York, York Art Gallery, York Castle Museum, um, the Yorkshire Museum and its Botanical Gardens, and York St Mary's Church. 
Um, as well as local council funding, uh, YNT is an Arts Council national portfolio organisation and receives £1.2 million annually from them, but 72% of its income uh, comes from visitor entrance fees, which is obviously causing quite a lot of issues with us at the moment being closed for quite a lot of the summer and just reopening now. Um, in governance terms, we have the chief exec, so Rianne King, um, who reports to our board of trustees, two of which are city council members, and we have a senior leadership team, obviously, as well. We also host uh, the region's Arts Council Museum Development Team and Portable Antiquities Officer. And for two of our sites, we have affiliated groups, uh, Yorkshire Phil Philosophical Society, uh, who first built the Yorkshire Museum and the Friends of York Art Gallery as well. So I just wanted to kind of give you a bit of context of the size of the museum service that we work for um, and a little bit about York itself. So York is a uh, kind of medium sized city. Um, it's a very tourist based city, not much industry. Um, and a lot of people think that we are a very white middle class city, but there's quite a lot of deprivation. And we have um, our biggest non white population is Chinese, um, mainly from the university, but we do have quite a lot of migrant population as well. Um, so collections. Our collections are designated by the Arts Council, which is quite exciting. And it's only one of a handful of regional museums to be given this award. Uh, we have archaeology, natural sciences, fine arts, ceramic art, social and military history, costume and textiles um, housed across all the sites. And we have about 2 million objects in total. Um, obviously not all of them on display and um, quite a lot of them are in store. Um, so uh, York Castle Museum is our largest site in collections and in footfall. It was originally part of a prison complex and a medieval castle, hence the name. Um, it's two 18th century jails connected by a 1970s link building, which is the bit that always leaks, not the older buildings, the 70s bit. Um, YMT has been wanting to redevelop the site for decades and time came when a new leadership came in and the city council wanted to revitalize the area. If anyone knows York, it's near Clifford's Tower and there's a huge car park right outside. Um, so it's a, a very, uh, unused space. So they really want to redevelop that site to make a new gateway to the city. Um, the, can the Castle Transformation Project plans to enhance our uniqueness as a museum, but also make it more modern and world-class in itself. So the Transformation Project also looks at how we can transform the way we work. And that's why my role was created. So my role was community engagement researcher, um, and I was part of a larger research team alongside um, a collections researcher and a lead researcher. And this was very much um, outside the day-to-day -day working of the trust. So it wasn't um, doing exhibitions or anything like that, it was really looking critically at how we're doing things um, and doing content development as well. So I was tasked with looking into marginalised and underrepresented histories in the collection. But in addition to this, um, my role was really to understand best practice in community engagement and look for opportunities um, for new strategies for engagement as well. And this led me to build three core relationships for the transformation project, but I was really keen for these to also work for the business as usual as well. So not just adjacent to the work, but actually core within YNT. So I was very aware of the danger of jumping straight in and promising the world to communities and individuals about what they could get from a capital project. So I decided to connect with a limited number just to introduce myself, the museum, the project, and get to know their organisation, their commitments, their goals and their values. And I wanted to ensure I was listening. And honestly, I rarely discuss the museum or the objects that we hold in our initial conversations. But we spoke about making change, writing wrongs um, and really understanding the needs of the community. I chose to have uh, conversations as well with community leaders rather than individuals to ensure that there was no kind of failing of expectations at this point. And um, because the whole project is 10, 15 year project. So um, we can't promise anything right at the beginning. But from these, I was able to feed directly into the planning of the project. Uh, these included free space for communities to hold meetings, access to collections and interpretation, and um, skills building, and a place to showcase their achievements and their campaigns. During this time, I also wanted to do a baseline assessment of what community engagement was at YMT to understand what we have done, what relationship we've had and how our partnerships work. And this is kind of what I found from that baseline assessment. So um, community engagement was spread kind of across three different parts of the trust. So the volunteers team and really their part in community engagement was 
advertising to try and get more people to volunteer. And this was within local communities and charities and organizations. And they held um, open sessions and would be able to adapt for specific needs of different groups as well, their general volunteering. Uh, the learning team um, focused on engagement with schools and charities that worked with young people, but often this was exhibition led rather than a deeper um, engagement. Curatorial, this was solely exhibition led and uh, people were used, and I use that word in, in a, um, on purpose, um, as a source for interpretation, as research and collecting. Um, through discussions with teams at YMT, we came up with a series of provocations about the way we've been working with communities. Um, so basically it was a funding led model that picked people up and dropped them off without taking into account the community's and individual's needs. And the main role was to have a physical outcome for an exhibition. Um, there was a limited understanding of groups needs and work rarely addressed the goals of the organization and individuals. Um, there's a lack of agency for groups to decide on how they want to be involved. And there was a habit of going to groups who looked good, um, who, who were in the news or who were a local group that have had a lot of um, news, um, such as like refugees and, and people like that. And also there was a lack of investment in relationship building and it was, all, and, um, it was always outcome led rather than just building connections with people. So in essence, um, unintentionally, the trust was working to a model that was exploitative to communities, uh, being focused on outcomes that benefit the trust and not the groups. And obviously this is um, not just YMT, many organizations go to this model. Um, so it may be familiar to many people. So I wanted to create a model, or propose a model at least, um, with communities that is beneficial to both parties. Um, looking at a scale of participation helped me to explain this, of how we could better as an organization um, by being informed of different ways to engage. So from merely just telling people information to empowerment, knowing what stage of participation you wanted um, gives you an understanding of what outcomes will be and the opportunities and risks and all that sort of stuff. So the main point of that was to share with as many people as possible to understand community engagement isn't just one thing, it's lots of different um, variations on a scale and you need to understand at what point of that scale you are and want to be, so you can understand what outcomes will be. So in addition to this, uh, we came up with ways to encourage community engagement and move away from the model of this exploitation. Um, and we kind of put these into three different categories. So the first one is governance, so sharing power, the uh, title of this series, um, and understanding what you can devolve is the first step. So we are gatekeepers and erect many barriers uh, to access due to a range of reasons, many of which are unintentional, uh, but decision making is, uh, is the biggest barrier and people and ideas need to be around the table in order to deliver real change. Uh, YMT has really diversified our trustee board. We're, in my opinion, one of the best um, museums to do that um, in the last few years, but we still need to devolve power to communities. Some models include like a board made of representatives or communities that we work with, um, or things uh, being decided through a democratic process, either through visitors or opening up to the city or uh, certain community groups. Uh, the other category is relationship building and trust. So the main point of this is forgetting about making money off the backs of communities. Uh, we need to build trust by showing our commitment by offering free entry, free space to use, supporting their funding bids, giving out competition prizes, little gestures go a long way to show you need them more than they need us. At the end of the day, museums are important, but there are a lot of stuff that they're fighting for is much more important than us. Uh, change in museums and interpretation practice as well was the last category. So ultimately, this is about being person-led, not object-led. Objects and spaces, spaces are what make us unique, uh, but without it, it's static and basically uninteresting. Uh, when you allow objects to reflect people's lived experiences, we get more out of them. Um, it's not just a teapot made in 1932 using a particular technique. It reminds someone of a time when their mother made them a cuppa and shared something personal with them. By opening up opportunities for interpretation, objects work um, for their keep. Um, they can't just be stuck in stores forever. They're, we have to use them beyond their innate significance. And this is particularly useful for decolonizations of collections, which uh, Paul and Manuel were talking about before as well. 
So I've got three case studies of the communities that I've been working with. Um, so uh, York has quite a unique uh, gypsy and traveler community. Uh, for generations, many of them have decided to settle in the city and have their own customs and traditions. So York Castle Museum reflected this in the 1960s by acquiring a wagon, refurbishing it and putting it on display. Uh, there was also some collecting of interior objects for the wagon as well. However, in the early 2000s, the wagon was taken off display and put into storage. The museum has frequent uh, inquiries from the community asking about its condition, whether or not it's been sold um, and given information about people's connections to it. And I would say there was an unconscious bias in the past um, about these inquiries as they were followed up with basic information and its whereabouts in history and not really um, connecting with the community enough. Um, this disconnect from the community with the object that they held so dear meant that a relationship needed to be rebuilt from scratch um, as any support for the, from the community we once had has disappeared um, and one of their most valued objects was taken off display and put into storage. So I met with York Travelers Trip regularly at the start of this project and obviously continue to, to today um, to understand what we could do for them. Unfortunately, obviously the biggest thing would be getting the wagon back on display, but that wasn't an option um, because it needed a lot of conservation work and it's just um, unavailable at the moment. We were able to provide letters of support for their funding bids and um, share our other collections and histories with them. And I think the most important thing was act as an advocate with other city organisations um, using our kind of kudos at the trust to get involved in different ways with different groups. We also consulted with them on an acquisition of a painting that depicted a gypsy camp um, down south and wanted to include their thoughts in the, in, um, the piece to check if it was discriminatory um, in any way. And this led into the interpretation and that was supposed to happen in the summer, um, but obviously we closed. So that will be um, redisplayed next year and we'll get uh, content uh, with the community group. Um, we've also committed to working with uh, York Travellers Trust as a long-term partner, um, not just with um, kind of history in our collections, but working with them on wider engagement and wider governance as well. I see the issue around the wagon as a contested heritage asset and connected to repatriation in the initiatives as well. The cultural value of the wagon to the community far exceeds its use to us in Stahl, which has been since the early 2000s. So the second case study is a uh, city of sanctuary. Uh, so York is a designated city of sanctuary uh, for people seeking refuge. Um, a local charity focused on Syrian refugees, but the regional arm uh, works with people from across the world seeking asylum in the UK. Uh, in the past, we gave free access to our sites quarterly for their regional group. It was really a standalone visit, which had no engagement from us. It was literally just letting them in for free. Um, and without a doubt, they found this really valuable. Um, as, it, as they framed these visits as a kind of tourist style day trip. However, I and many of my team were uncomfortable with the way we were engaging with refugees. So for instance, we'd um, count how many people came in. So we put that on our Arts Council um, uh, evaluation and things like that. But at the end of the day, they were literally just coming in and we were doing very little with them. So uh, this is something that um, I regret doing, <laughs> but this is one of the things I want to talk about. So we had a temporary exhibition at the time, um, early last year, which we had an open call for donations. And we worked with the Museum of Broken Relationships in Zagreb. So we had a temporary exhibition come to York for that, which is really exciting. And we decided to speak to York City of Sanctuary to ask about donating some objects. And this was the worst thing I've ever done in my career. Um, so sitting in a meeting in a museum talking about different types of relationships that can break is one thing, but talking to people who have experienced such trauma and ask them to share that trauma with the world was not appropriate. So we discussed what they needed and we came up with a new engagement strategy, which was a session um, which welcomes Syrian refugees to the city uh, and to the museum. And we gave 40 people free entry to the museum free time and then space to have lunch and display some objects. And the biggest thing that I learned here was the space for conversation was far more important than anything museum me that I was trying to shoehorn in. Just allowing people to have a space and use that space um, how they ever wanted. And I like these sessions to become regular for new arrivees to, to York, but also um, more settled people as well. 
So the final group um, case study that I want to talk about is our LGBTQ plus community in York. So since 2014, we have been working directly with LGBTQ plus people in the city. It started as I identify as LGBTQ and was given the opportunity to research some LGBT history for the First World War. From this, we have continued to work with the community to better understand our collections and histories. However, as a white gay man with privilege, and me writing history is not how we should continue. Um, for the celebration, for the partial decrim decriminalization of homosexuality, um, we worked with a group from the local community to put on a temporary exhibition in our 1960s pub. Uh, they made it a gay bar and put in people's memories of the time and more information about what it was like to be gay, not only in the 60s, but up to the present day. The group did not just include gay men, but it was lesbians and people um, who were trans were in it as well. This was a great step. However, um, our object, the objectives were not to insert queer stories into our general displays or bring in new objects. We did acquire some flags, um, but we did not collect personal experiences or look at our collection through a queer lens in any way. And the group was disbanded uh, after the project finished too. So going forward, we are working with York LGBT Forum more closely on wider initiatives rather than just exhibition content, so similar to York Travelers Trust. Uh, and we are looking at how we can support trans rights in our work and sharing our knowledge and history um, for other initiatives that they are doing as well. So giving our research away so they can uh, do podcasts and things like that. So those are my case studies. So I just wanna kind of say what's going on now. Um, so YNT, like many organizations have um, been affected quite drastically by the restrictions brought in through the pandemic. And we've had to close our sites, cancel our public engagement offer and postpone many projects um, and redirect funds to ensure that we survive. Uh, we have been successful in some funding bids like the Arts Council uh, things, um, but has resulted in many redundancies and a new structure has been put in place. However, engagement has been raised as a major part of our future and we will be working towards a more equitable model of community engagement. So do watch this space. But again, the caveat is we were planning lots of stuff post COVID um, and we are now having to re well, change it basically and talk about this. But the work that we did for the Casual Transformation Project hopefully will now embed within YMT as well, rather than just the transformation project going forward. So that was my presentation and the question just to finish off is what do we think the most important factor is in building strong relationships with the community? Um, my 10 pence really is just, well, obviously listening is the obvious one, but making sure that it's an equitable relationship and you are ensuring that you work towards their goals and not just yours. So yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Philip. Uh, we're now moving on to our final speakers of today, um, and that's uh, some of my Ipswich colleagues. That's um, Melanie Hollis and Ivy Scott, um, and they're part of the team who are working on the upcoming Power of Stories exhibition, which sees three costumes from Marvel Studios' 2018 film Black Panther come to Christchurch Mansion in Ipswich. So both Melanie and Ivy are going to speak from uh, their own perspectives about the challenges and opportunities of working on a high profile project in a collaborative way. Thank you, Liz. Um, I echo most of what Philip says about listening to communities and trying to be useful. Um, so I think the chat's going to be interesting um, with questions coming in. Um, thank you for having us today. Ivy's going to be doing most of the talking, um, I'm pleased to say. But I've been asked to chip in with a few of my thoughts um, from my perspective as a white, non-disabled cis woman working as a collections and learning curator um, who doesn't have much authority but does have a bit of power. So that's exactly what you're getting, my thoughts. It's not a polished talk about a finished piece of work. These are some of our reflections slap bang in the middle of a work in progress. And progress really is the word here, um, because for me, this work is about positive change and not perfection. So I won't be talking about the nuts and bolts of what we're doing because that will be talked about more in the next few months. Uh, and I'd encourage you to follow us on social media or through our blog posts to um, find out more. 
just to contextualise the work we're talking about today, Power of Stories is an exhibition and engagement project we've been working on for over a year, due to open in April 2021. Uh, and it seeks to create a stepping stone towards bigger, longer lasting change, both for our organisation and for the community it's part of. Um, we also want to give our local young people something about which they can be proud and we also want to be useful to our community. We also have um, a, an aim to broaden the audience profile of Christchurch Mansion. And our brief was to be catalytic. So this coincided with a conversation with our community panel um, who challenged us to do something that appealed to a wider range of people and which allowed us to link to our historic collections in a positive way. And so what we're trying to do through this project is to achieve some degree of success by holding up a mirror to our institution, to history and to society. And so we're inspecting and shifting who gets to tell the story and which story is told. We're exploring the role stories play in shaping our views of each other. And we're trying to emphasize the importance of critical thinking in our currently baffling world. So we are trying to share power we have as curators with local people, in particular those of African and Afro-Caribbean heritage. Uh, and with three costumes coming from Black Panther at its heart, anything other than co-curation would have been highly inappropriate for this exhibition and immensely damaging. Um, and we have six wonderful community curators who have chosen and vetoed objects for the displays shaped the tone and made decision about narratives we will follow and avoid. They have authored, co-authored and edited text. They have reviewed and influenced exhibition designs and they have lent their wisdom and grace to difficult and thought changing conversations. And I just want to say thank you to Ivy and the other curators, Imani, Lanai, Glenn, Daisy and Mike for everything that they bring to this. Um, and actually to thank all of the wonderful members of our community who are, are contributing to this game-changing work. I'm not claiming it's perfect, uh, in fact, far from it. But as I said, we're not aiming for perfect. We've started and we're learning. And actually our external evaluation is happening as the project unfolds, which is hugely insightful. Um, and it's informing our progress in real time. From the outset at a curatorial level, we've worked with transparency and respect and humility. This has been hard, largely because we're working within systems and hierarchies, which are over 150 years old and they're designed not to share power, but that's not a reason not to do it. And I recognize that my role has been to kind of hold back those systems long enough for our community curators um, to have the time and space to shape this exhibition according to their hopes and needs. Um, I'd say it's also been hard because it takes my whole self to do this work. It's human work um, and I can't leave it on the desk. It's emotional, it can be stressful and it requires constant self-reflection. Uh, it's fair to say that our organisation is learning how to support its staff and community contributors more effectively when doing this type of work. But it's also thrilling and it's joyous and it's soul changing and it's uplifting. And having the support of our funder, the Arts Council, to work in this organic power sharing way with our community is invaluable. To some colleagues, this work and this way of working appears to be chaos. Uh, but that's because the norm is quite a controlled process and we're challenging it. It's messy because it's different, but it needs to be. It has to make space for multiple perspectives, which are just as important, um, actually more, more important than mine. Hi, and um, I'm about to begin. Um, my name is Ivy Scott, and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm just going to talk through um, some of the lessons um, we have learned um, as a group working with the museum. So 
So um, we I wanted to begin by um, looking at what is decolonization. And um, obviously there are lots of definitions of decolonization. Um, um, to decolonize is to acknowledge the real colonial past and to think self-critically about how that past operate in the present. Um, but looking at the SOAS one, um, we need to understand it as the effort to interrogate and transform the institutional, structural, and epistemological legacies of colonization. But in this one as well, uh, looking at, um, we do not want the next generation to be thinking what has been left out. So today I'm going to look at our initial meeting with the museum, the challenges um, we faced, the opportunities, the outcomes, and looking at ways forward. So where do we go um, from here? So um, the initial invitation from the museum, um, we were asked to, um, they were told us that they would love the community to attend and be consulted. They wanted us to get involved. Um, we shared a vision and I think most of us were very excited because to have um, the Marvel Black Panther coming to um, Ipswich, we wanted to be involved in that. And it was good um, that the museum asked the community. Um, I first got involved with the museum in, by having an, uh, a discussion um, yearly um, in Ipswich. We put on a, a Winrus exhibition and I'm part of the Winrus Select Committee. And I met with the museum because I wanted to involve the school and I also wanted to involve the museum as well. Um, the, we also talked about engaging um, black groups and Caribbean people are not a homogeneous group. We are made up of uh, at least six or seven different islands and probably more than that. And similar to Africa where there are lots of countries. So one of the ideas is that um, we each bring our own perspective to the table. But it was also good to be a community curator to have a say in what the museum was doing. So what were some of the challenges for us? I think the major challenge was the time and people fitting in to the times of the meetings which happened in the morning. Um, it was also um, initially, um, there was no leadership. Um, we were a group and we felt we were a bit disjointed, but then we had um, Elma Glasgow who came along and add some coherence and um, made the group a lot more strategic um, and sort of, uh, again, more um, control. We felt uh, uh, with Elma coming, there was um, control and we could see where we were going. Uh, people did drop out initially because um, we, um, a lot of us are freelance workers, we are consultants, and we had to balance um, between um, doing voluntary work and also paid work. And therefore some, some people who wanted to be involved could not get involved. And we also knew that this was going to be over a long term, it was going to be a long term project. So we needed to be involved, not one or two meetings, but continuously. And again, there was no monetary incentive. Um, um, we didn't have travel costs, we didn't have vouchers. Um, so it was quite um, difficult to, um, to work with the museum at the time. And we also felt that the senior managers, the people we were talking to in the museum worked with us um, very upfront um, but sometimes we felt that the managers were not always hearing um, what we were saying. In terms of opportunities, um, as a result of working with the museum, uh, the Windrush project um, was again extended because we usually work with the town hall, a one day exhibition, and it was absolutely wonderful to find 
that um, the work, the display could then go to the museum and the museum could display um, the, the display for another week or so. And a lot of people in Ipswich had been asking for the Windrush display to be more than a day. And the museum offered a solution. Um, there was sincere interest from the black community. We were interested. We wanted to work with the museum. We wanted to change that narrative because as black people, we don't really go into museums because a lot of us felt that um, what is in the museum is not of interest to us. It's not about our history and it's not about our culture. But the museum staffing um, is also not representative of the black community. Um, so people were engaged with and committed to finding collaborative space. We wanted to work with the museum. We wanted to bring our perspective um, to the, the work that we were doing. But we also discussed what is true collaboration. Is it a win-win or is it a win-lose? And who holds the power in deciding what displays um, are put into museum? What, um, in terms of the Black Panther, what will be displayed? And I think for us, we found that the museum staff were very open to our ideas and um, to our reflections. And one of those was that um, initially um, they talked about having a wedding dress at the entrance of the museum. And we looked at, but how is that going to represent the African and the Caribbean and the Asian community? And we discussed and eventually we came to, we used the book, um, Mufara's Beautiful Daughter. Um, we felt that we could use an African wedding dress. So there were opportunities to share our perspectives and concern, but also we had opportunities to uh, reflect and address our thinking. So at each meeting, we talked about um, the wording, we talked about how we felt, we talked about um, how did we feel about what the museum was, was doing. There were also other opportunities to be involved in other areas. Um, Ipswich now has a new hold, a new archives, and we were invited to, again, to talk to the group and explain our perspectives. Um, the museum with us, we have applied for grants for various groups within the community so that we will be able to put on um, in sort of collaboration with the Black Panther, um, we are able to put on some things as well. And we also had um, the museum expansion survey, which we um, were involved in. Okay. So this um, shows you some of the work we did. And it was absolutely wonderful working with the museum because we discussed language. We looked at wording. We talked about, um, we didn't like that word because um, it reminded us, of, reminded us of colonization or it's not the appropriate word to use um, at this particular time. And this one, changing the narrative, discussing um, change. And um, you can see a sentence there, some displayed items were stolen or taken unethically when Britain invaded and ruled over other countries. And we, after a lot of discussion, we came up with some displays, some display items were taken unethically when Britain invaded and ruled other countries. But we came to that from a discussion uh, where people were able to share their perspectives. So what are the outcomes? Um, how do museums um, reconceive their mission at a time of great social reckoning across race and gender? Um, we, we know museums need to change to be inclusive of, um, of people in the community. And we wanted a very inclusive and decolonized exhibition. We wanted to reach communities. And as I said previously, some of our communities would not come into the museum. But um, as we are members of the community, we know that um, we can talk to people in our communities and we are sure that with the Marvel exhibition that our communities will be coming to have a look 
um, because they're going to feel um, included. Um, again, um, inclusive of those who do not normally attend museum, um, moving forward towards a democratic process with local community. So having a range of communities involved. So yes, we're the Windrush group, but there are also other groups from within the community who are involved. Um, we talked about recruitment and selection. And as we said, um, we don't often see um, black members of the community involved in the museum, working in the museum. And the museum um, now, because um, when there is a post going, um, they would send the advert to us so that we know what that post is and we can encourage community members um, to, apply, um, to apply for them. We are, as the Windrush group, we are part of a bigger group called the Suffolk Black Community Forum, um, which is a consultative um, forum. And again, we can seek the uh, opinion of um, members um, on that forum. But we also have had opportunities to work in paid projects in our own rights as consultants. And I think that is, um, that has been an, an eye opener in terms of being involved in things like this. And I think we need to be visible. And part of that visibility is being seen as consultants. So we have a growing visible presence, not only um, as consultants, but in discussions as well within the museum. So looking at going forward, um, and we do want to go forward with the museum. And one of the things we are saying, yes, we know as Mel mentioned that the going will get tough sometimes and there will be many challenges, uh, but we are prepared for that. And um, the group has now um, bonded together and we are not afraid to express our opinions because we feel that we are in a safe place, that we can work through emotions and we can rise to whatever challenges there are. We want to move forward by involving the wider community. So not just African and Caribbean, but looking at our Asian community, looking at refugees, looking at some of our, for example, we have a large um, Portuguese African community. We would like them to be involved as well and to bring their perspective um, to, the, to the table. Um, more pair community projects. Um, we would like to have, for example, use the whole to have um, African history lectures and exhibitions. And we have already begun to talk to the museum about running workshops, about having exhibitions, for example, our Windrush um, elders in the community. We want to look at, they have been involved in a local group cranes where they've worked um, their lives um, listening to them talk, it's a real eye opener. And we would like to see that that history is not lost. But we want to move past enslavement as well. And for people to realize that enslavement is a very small portion of the history and culture of African and Caribbean people. And we want to look at, um, for example, um, Africa before enslavement. We want to look at the local community. We want, we have a very strong black church. We have black artists. We have community groups. Um, so we want to reach out to, um, to those groups as well. Uh, but we, we essentially want to, um, to do those lectures ourselves, to be involved in the discussion with the museum. And that is happening. Uh, we are moving forward. Um, and one of the questions I would like to leave you with, and I think um, I would like to leave you with that because it has been very effective in the way the museum has involved the black community and the way we came to the table to share um, our, our sort of background, to share our knowledge, to look at language that might be offensive um, to the black community. Like for example, not using the word bane. Um, because it's not a, a word that we like, it's not a word that 
um, the black community came forward with. Um, so my question that I would like to leave you with is what empowering strategies can you museums use to ensure a variety of local communities and young people are involved in decolonizing museums. Okay, thank you for listening. And, um, um, and I've mentioned some of the ways that our museums might begin to involve local communities. And I'm really hoping that um, we begin to see a lot more communities coming into museum, um, enjoying and seeing themselves reflected in the community. And uh, I've ended with um, a local exhibition by John Ferguson. And um, this has been in Ipswich. And this is one of the ways of involving the community in their history, in their culture, but also taking that community into museums so that we can support the museum, but they can also support us in archiving our history and moving forward as a community, we want to leave something for, um, for the generation that comes after us. So we want to see um, some of the things that have happened in our communities, explore and uh, be part of the museum. And again, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that wonderful paper, Ivy um, and Mel. That was absolutely brilliant. It was really interesting. And I think that actually all three of the papers we had tonight, they spoke really, really well to each other. Um, now, I just wonder if everyone can sort of unmute themselves, put their cameras back on, that kind of thing. Um, so we actually don't really have that much time left for, uh, for, for questions. Um, but I think really, I think the overriding thing that we can take away from this session really is this whole idea of how, of this idea of how important this uh, concept of sharing power is. And, and also I think it's about uh, not just sharing power, but it's about empower, uh, empowering people as well at the same time. Um, I also thought maybe if, if there's any questions that any of you might want to ask to each other, because I think obviously like the papers did speak really, really well to each other. Trying to... Anyone? I'm, I'm just going to ask the other museums. Um, <laughs> What are the sort of things um, that you have done to create opportunities and to engage local communities? And, and I'm talking about um, the wider communities, people that we do not often see uh, in museums or who might feel that museums are not part of their culture or I'm not going to a museum because it's not reflective of my culture. Mm -hmm. Also, um, in terms of going to museums, um, we see museums are perpetuating, sorry, perpetuating um, the racism within society. So one of the displays I went to in a museum, I walked in and there were, um, it was a forest scene, there were animals. And my first um, response was, um, Africa is more than about animals. Um, what else could museums do to encourage um, local communities again to be involved in that discussion. I mean Ipswich has done really well and I would like to see that um, method adapted by more museums and I think it has been absolutely wonderful on picking language and um, because there's language that you might find offensive so it was really good to discuss with people their perceptions and their sort of um, issues around language with them. Does anyone want to answer from, from just, your call? Um, just, uh, just to say first, Ivy, I really enjoyed your presentation and that also um, get, uh, the, the way you got into the kind of realities of a group and it really resonated a lot with um, what it's like working um, with young people. Um, and you mentioned even like, when you, you know, when you form a group and even having the time, like for example, the art assassins, we've been working for the whole year and only had two hours a week. And, you know, cause they've got school and college and, you know, it's quite a lot of, a, a lot to ask. And also Melanie, when you mentioned about the kind of stuff appearing to be chaos, um, but there's actually, it, that's what needs to happen to kind of break down systems. 
But just to try and answer your question, Ivy, and speaking from the perspective of young people, I think for me, it's about, um, it's trying to it's trying to look at this like, asset-based model of um, programming. So it's like what, what uh, rather than just saying like, this is art, this is what great art is, and, you know, a kind of top-down approach, it's like looking at what young people are already doing in their own lives um, and trying to give a platform and you know it's about giving sharing power but it's also very practical it's about space and time I think we have the for us we have these buildings um, how can we yeah it kind of empower young people and give them a space to kind of do what they do so for example in this project one of our young people um, runs a, a spoken word night so we kind of gave some of the budget for her to run the event so it's, yeah so for me I think it's yeah trying to get away from this idea of uh, just about about validation I think I would hope that we can kind of validate what young people do and that in turn will kind of make them feel that the, the gallery is a space for them because we, as we know many people attest to your experience of feeling like it's not a space for them so for me that's a kind of simple way I think um, well that I'm trying to do in, here in, my, in my work. Mm -hmm. Mel, did you want to say something? I just wanted to kind of um, add to that, really. And there are two really basic things which have underpinned the work we've done, which I think are applicable anywhere. Um, and one is starting with how can we help rather than how can you help us? Yeah. <laughs> so really listening and, and like you said, be, be, trying to give a platform and to be useful. The other thing I've forgotten, it might come back to me in a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I also just wanted to add, I think it's also really important to, you know, there's there's the critique that happens from, you know, from within the black community, for example, around Black History Month is, why is it just a month? And, you know, why do we only have these unique, like set portions of time to look at black history? But one thing that was really, uh, that I really took away from the project with the South London Gallery is that, Colonial history is also British history. Mm -hmm. And so it's not simply just using these moments of engaging communities just on what we see as like black history. Like how can we engage the local white community over histories of colonialism as well? So I think like also having an understanding that like when we're trying to engage communities, it's not just from a perspective of like, how can we you know, provide them with a narrative of like all the atrocities, but also engage you know, the, you know, the wider UK of of histories that are shared histories as well. And I think, as you said, Ivy, in your presentation, like that's so key, it's not just like doom and gloom, but, and it's not just the responsibility of, of uh, marginalized communities to have to engage with these issues when they're to do with like, you know, these violences as well. So yeah, certainly like bringing in the wider community on issues that are, that don't necessarily seem to be relevant to them, but actually are. Yeah, I think obviously echoing everyone's, um, what everyone just said, but, especially with museums like like York and other kind of northern cities and maybe even middle class cities have been put like that. Um, we've been lying to ourselves for quite a long time that we're out of this conversation. Um, our museum collection itself was kind of built in the 1930s, but there's a lot of exploitation within it, especially our military collection. Um, and the, the, the whole language around the way we've interpreted stuff and where we've accessioned things, um, it's been, like many curators kind of swept under the carpet like it's not on our online collection um, and just kind of being honest about we have difficult stuff which people might not expect in a little museum in York um, but we need to be honest about it and we need to show where we've gone wrong in the past and how we can make that better for the future um, but just opening up more and not being offended by people saying that we're wrong or that we've done something wrong in the past like don't be too and this is from a person that takes everything personally and um, just don't be too personal about it it's mm. where everyone's learning mm. doesn't mean um you are wrong as an individual it just means you're perpetuating that wrong that and you need to change and help with it Brilliant, thank you for that. Now I'm going to ask a couple of the questions that we've had through. I think there's probably too many to get through, but there's some quite specific, interesting ones. Um, one of the questions was for Philip, and that's um, how did you deal with the potentially negative responses when you, uh, say for example, when you took down the um, the wagon from display? Um, well, the, the response, like I said, was very kind of unconscious bias with it. So there wasn't that much response in the first place. It's just curatorial reasons it cannot be put on display anymore full stop um, and the conversations I was having with directly the community was again being honest about it and just saying look when it was taken off display 
it was taken off in a way that means we now need to conserve it in order to take it out of store. Um, so we'll need to get funding for it to do that sort of stuff. And I'm not going to lie, it's the elephant in the room with every conversation because it is such an important, oh, it's not even an artifact, it's such an important part of their culture and part of their community that um, it, it's always there and it's always a discussion point. So I think there's always going to be these difficult conversations and kind of addressing those is going to be a constant thing. But again, not hiding away from it and ignoring it, mm. not letting it just be in the elephant room, obviously saying we are still trying to do things, we'll work together to make things better, mm. um, but not just forgetting about it. Does that answer the question? Sorry. Yeah, no, that does. Absolutely. I think I think it's always very difficult. I mean, whatever objects you're talking about, as soon as anything comes off display that people that people love, then there's always going to be things said. But particularly when it's something that's so important and integral to the community, like I think, yeah. you know, it's quite a difficult thing to deal with, of course. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask a question now to uh, Paula and Emmanuel, which was um, during the course of the project, how did it change as a result of sharing power? Um, how did the project itself change? Yeah. Um, I'm just, I need a second to think. If I'm if you want to go ahead, you can do Yeah, I think one thing that sticks out for me, which we didn't really get to talk about too much, um, was just the way that the exhibition, I mean, not that we've had it yet, but the way that that developed. Mm. Um, I think it was really interesting, you know, obviously trying to complicate all these issues to do with power and issues to do with um, uh, colonialism. But, you know, the young people still really stuck to this, They, in, a, in a, an amazing way, they really stuck to this ethical question. And it meant that it, it was a real challenge to kind of push past that and be like, okay, we, we understand this, this archive is really, you know, it's really challenging. How can we still present it basically? Um, but obviously because we were leaning on them and it was guided by them, we had to really take our time with those ethical questions. So we spent a lot of time just talking about it basically um so that for me is how I would say it, it kind of developed um a lots of time talking and you know perhaps less time on like okay let's have this in this room and let's hang this up and you know like it kind of they really just wanted to explore the issues more and more mm -hmm. um I don't know if you'd agree with that Paul but absolutely and it's just made me think it's also you know we were trying to be um instigate collaborative or uh, project the whole time so even like the I mentioned the film very briefly and that's quite important for me because often when we do a film about a project it's a the filmmaker comes in does some interview shots and that overlays with um kind of you know uh, b-roll of the project and at the very start we're like well that's not very fitting if we're talking about like you know anthropology and gays and who has power so we offered it out to the group and they were kind of recording video diaries and so we're trying to kind of dis distribute power but it kind of it also reminded me of something that came up in Ivy's presentation which is sometimes when there's no leader sometimes get the decision making can be really difficult so we fell into old traps we fell into you know we had to cobble stuff together um we had to you know make decisions as the the, as the programmers so yeah I think like um this it, that, that kind of the the kind of layers of power sharing you know were distributed then we came back and you know that's something again like I mean I've, I've been trying to think about how we make improve that for other projects and maybe it's also about time scale and you know not you know and um parameters and what we what we can achieve so yeah it totally shifted brilliant thank you so much for that so as we're slightly running over time i better wrap up at this point but i wanted to say thank you so much to all of the speakers we've had tonight it's been absolutely brilliant and I think your papers have really spoken to each other about this idea of sharing power and thinking thinking about how we're going forward in the future and sort of working on these kind of projects and um, so just uh, to say quickly uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel as well very soon um, our next and final session session six uh, will be next Wednesday um, and that is going to be uh, at between 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. And the subject of that is all together now. Um, so just to say again, thank you uh, so much for watching. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, do put them, pop them up on, on Twitter and uh, tagging us and things, which is culture, uh, hashtag culture D and D. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>